Welcome back to High Performance Computing. Today we have our lecture one, the real start of the course, if you want, basically giving you a big overview about high performance computing, uh, more or less from a 10,000 feet perspective um, before we dive then into the concrete materials in the course. But before we dive into the materials basically of this lecture, let us review what we had the last time. <clears throat> the last time was really just getting you a little bit up to speed with Unix systems. Um, obviously, this was an introduction to Unix and SSH, which is rather a very short introduction, so not at all a complete lecture on Unix. Unix is very powerful. Um, we here basically just took a few couple of things to show you a little bit um, for what you can actually use it and how it actually fits in the context of this course, because many of the HPC systems that you will basically face and work with uh, in your career, if you be in the area of HPC, will be largely driven by Unix derivatives. So basically some Unix operating systems um, that are basically common practice today. And beyond Unix and several commands, which were quite useful to understand also the remote setup of HPC machines. If you remember, we kind of locked in two different systems, the deep systems on the left side here, um, basically, that you have in Jülich in Germany, and we looked in our Icelandic teaching cluster, Jutun, that you have here in Iceland. The modus operandi, how you do is how you log in, is usually very similar. There are some differences in security, as we have seen. I come to that in the moment with SSH keys, but the handling once you're logged in on the Unix area is quite similar. So you have the command host name minus A. As an example, that shows you very nicely that you're actually indeed now in a different host, especially if you log in to different systems. You see also that the username Morris at Utun or Riedel1 at Deep um, is also deferring often between the different HPC centers um, because they don't have really a common accounting system. But still, basically, once you're logged in, uh, Unix gives you a little bit a kind of de facto standard how you can work this is system. And we have seen then there's another important environment, um, which is basically inside this Unix environment that we use in HPC incredibly often. And this is the module environment. We have seen <clears throat> basically there are lots of modules available. Also, this differs between different HPC systems. You see here quite a variety of software, which is already installed for you, easily to use, like Python, for instance, but also, of course, bigger software. Also, the underlying libraries that we will see a little bit today, thinking about deep learning, when I introduce this a little bit, based on GPUs, on CUDA, you see here QDNN. So these are all basically elements or PyTorch here, which you use then for deep learning, for instance. So hence, before you basically have to install all these different pieces of software, chances are if you do module avail, that some administrators already has installed crucial software. That's not true for everything, and of course not possible for every software which may require. But chances are that you talk with the HPC administrator of a center, that they actually also are able to install basically one or two of these libraries. Take into account that these people are often quite overcommitted, so it's quite a responsible job there and lots of things to do. So this may take time, but still is a, perhaps in the long term a better way of installing software on this HPC machine, so it's available to everyone or to or every member of the research group. Then the second part really of this um, first, let's say, warm-up practical lecture was then to getting you a little bit up to speed with SSH. Again, it's not a complete introduction to the SSH protocol. You can do there also a lot of things with SSH forwarding and whatnot. But today, or the last time, basically, we, we have to use this for connecting to different systems, to the deep system. Um, we used here basically the interesting MobileX term that I recommended to you as a kind of client for this. If you remember, we need always an SSH client that is on your host in order to connect to a remote HPC system. Now, how the world usually works when you go beyond our teaching cluster Jutun, you will find usually an SSH key protected system. That means a simple username password from our internet in the university, which we do in Jutun, 
is basically not really existing in the real world when you have real HPC systems to make it more secure. That in turn requires so-called SSH key pairs that we discussed. And uh, the key idea, of course, is that this is a private public key pair. Hence, the private key that you generate with SSH should always resign on your laptop or on your own host, whatever it is, in a specific key store. And the public key of this SSH key, you can upload everywhere. So this is no problem to share. This is something which is then uploaded in the accounting systems of the HPC systems, or basically you can share it in, in different servers. But the private key is really never to go out to any other system. Obviously, that is used once you access basically um, a HPC system and you present basically your um, identity and the public key is already uploaded. Basically, the system will check if you have basically the matching private key. And if not, of course, you have not access. If yes, then basically you'd see that your private key works. Um, careful also if you have perhaps different private keys for different systems and you basically use a private key of another system that is, of course, not anymore the matching one with a public key, then access is denied. And if you'd continue to try this over three, four times, uh, chances are that the HPC system blocks you for a while because this could be considered also as a security attack or anything else, which basically prevents, um, you know, uh, malicious users to get access to these HPC systems. So um, long story short, a very practical lecture, but of course, needless to say, if you are practicing then HPC in, in basically when you are in companies or in academics, uh, you will learn to handle Unix and SSH on a daily basis almost. But let us come to the topic of today, high performance computing, the real start of the course. Basically, after now we have the prologue and some Unix and SSH details, which are more or less common general um, computer science knowledge, if you want. Um, now we want to dive a little bit into the basic building blocks of HPC, um, why visualizations are often basically in line with it, the motivation of scientific computing alongside it, and then also a little bit about performance benchmarks and also why we talk about supercomputers when we have high performance computing. For this, <clears throat> we have to understand a bit about architectures. And this is also a very, um, let's say, elaborate topic. Usually you can have computer architectures as a whole course, obviously, so we are here kind of share lights on several different pieces, which then enables us to understand how supercomputers are built, why high performance computing is basically possible, and why, for instance, elements like the network interconnectivity is crucial for parallel programming, which is then something which basically these supercomputers and high performance computing enable, and there the interconnect is very important. Um, on the other hand of the scale, we see if you combine, for instance, two paradigms like shared memory and distributed memory, um, then you have so-called hybrid programming. This is quite complex, and that is what we will end with. In the second part, then we look a bit broader and think about what is the HPC ecosystem in software technologies. Um, and with this, we come firstly, of course, to the software environments that you partly already know with a module system, for instance, but also about um, using different architecture pieces of modern supercomputers today, which are the many core GPUs, we call them so-called accelerators, because they're able to accelerate certain parts of your problem. We will talk about this, of course, in context of machine and deep learning, but nowadays GPUs are used also in a wide variety of software in the HPC domain. Then we talk a little bit of, on going broader on the large scale of infrastructures and we'll finish a little bit with giving a sneak preview on quantum computing, although we have a complete lecture towards the end of the course on that. So an interesting overview, I hope, um, where you understand the latest developments in parallel processing and HPC, um, how we now basically assemble these big boxes that you always see when we talk about supercomputers, we call them REC. Um, what are basically the basic ingredients, which are still, of course, multi-core chips, many-core chips. We will understand a little bit the difference on this, 
but then also thinking about when you want to use them all in parallel, these different boxes here, then we will learn about shared memory and distributed memory programming, which can be quite complex to program. And this is, of course, something to find out during your first assignment. Parallel programming is a bit more tough than, you know, the normal Java uh, programming that you maybe have for a in UI interface to program or something like this. So um, fasten your seatbelt and we start basically with the first part now to really review a little bit what we now think is high performance computing, how we could define it. Um, well, the first thing to find out is basically that often HPC and supercomputers are talked uh, in the same line of thought, which is perhaps not always true. You would say a supercomputer is here in the Wikipedia definition, a computer really on the Formula One, really on computing, especially when it's about speed processing capacity. Um, but of course, HPC could mean much more than that. So basically you say that sometimes HPC could be also used in a smaller cluster. We still would call that HPC if, for instance, is a good interconnect there. It may not fit into the top 500 of supercomputers yet, but still the way how you program it is HPC. So that's why I think um, supercomputers are very important. They drive the design of HPC the future, but where HPC really is um, now deployed and so on could be also uh, smaller clusters, which not necessarily would be the cutting edge supercomputers we know today. If you look at also from the more broader perspective, another way to define it on four different levels, which is a very good book, by the way, um, that have some really good basics on HPC here that defines it rather in that way, that we have a certain amount of theory with basically uh, known physical models um, that we then tackle with numerical laws, numerical methods, and in order to get a speed up of some certain simulations, we have all the technology, multi-core, many-core networks, interconnect storages. The architecture is important of these HPC machines. Do we talk about shared memory, distributed memory, um, how we basically see then the interconnectivity of the nodes? And then, of course, the software ecosystem should not be forgotten that like libraries, things you already know a little bit with modules, schedulers, um, the application software bundles, this is also incredible important. So in a way you say these are the four basic building blocks today. And as I was alluding to before, remember also we said network interconnectivity is very important. That's why I highlight here again, the connections between the different nodes here with this green element, which also is a difference to clouds, for instance. And this is bas basically summarized here a little bit uh, as part of this slide where HPC can be really defined where the network interconnect is very important, while HTC, which is so-called its counterpart, very often also um, uh, basically in clouds, but clouds of course have today also smaller HPC clusters, but the way often how cloud programming works, you see that in our complementary cloud computing and big data course is often rather on the high throughput computing basis, so there you aggregate basically lots of different computing power and the network interconnect is not really so important. Things like MapReduce are a good example. There's no really application required. MapReduce is one part of the cloud computing. What we learn um, basically there's no interconnect required. You just basically um, cut the problem into different pieces and at the end you merge some results. But in between there's no really lots of inter um, you know, inter-process communication, as you would call it, as in usually HPC applications. And this we will review a little bit now. So what does that mean, uh, inter-process communication? What does it mean to do parallel computing? There we have different live streams of an application. Um, basically, that means that we have this different cores, um, for instance, here, or nodes in a way that have then this course, and you have different um, basically processes that are really in parallel executing a problem, but of course in a cooperative way. So this is parallel processing really, um, which drives many of the scientific and engineering applications in this course. And um, 
why that is so important is also that it then increases off the speed. We talk about a speed up by including more of these parallel processors. And this is something what we will also learn, of course, in lecture three in the course more generally also when we talk about MPI. So this is just really the first idea of thinking about um, that we don't have really one stream um, of a processor that is then handling everything, but rather we cut it on to different pieces and then have different processes in a cooperative way, tackling a very complex problem. And the complexity is best explained sometimes when we use scientific visualizations. That's why this topic is a little bit here also important. Um, it's also better to have a better insight, really, when you think about that these problems are quite complex. You see here the turbine, for instance, of an aircraft, um, the stress on the material that you want to basically analyze to research in order to design better turbines. For example, you have computer fluid, computational fluid dynamics problems like the aircraft here with turbulence that you see coming out basically out of these turbines and created by the aircraft. So the visualization often carries, let's say, um, you know, a lot of insights about the application and you will find in many of the scientific and engineering domains, you have always some scientific visualization, which is basically alongside it. In many cases, it offers also a good interdisciplinary um, communication between different scientists or domain experts or power computing experts, which is needed in order to really tackle these large scale problems today, like the simulation of a human brain, for instance, cutting edge deep learning models to do land cover classification here in remote sensing, or you see here basically the smoke um, or the ash rather that came out of the volcano Ayafetia Yukuk a couple of years ago. So things like that are typical, let's say HPC applications, and um, they have certain objectives. And you see also the way how no parallel computing works is that you would say, when you want to simulate, for instance, really the whole coast of Iceland somewhere, you would put that into different pieces, maybe also having the fish flow and basically a boat over it, whatever it is. You would not basically have this all on one processor. And then you basically see that would be anyway too complex to compute with all the waves, with basically that you have in the ocean if you want to do a real simulation or let's say almost real towards reality. So there are certain objectives in this um, that you basically can, can understand when you want to do um, visualization of it and HPC on a certain domain. We have something which we call domain decomposition that you see quite nicely here with unstructured grids, for instance, with a race car, if you want to understand basically the, the flow around or the airflow around and, in Formula One car or the turbulence that you see here, the grid is an important factor how you do parallel computing. And we will explore more of this in the course. And then of course, the particle information is a little bit different there. It's basically about the different pieces of the particles. And here you see a blood pump, for instance, um, that is basically created also with HPC in order to understand how this could be really working and basically how the stress is again on the materials. So um, you see a couple of objectives for scientific realization, really, and, and every now and then it even helps scientists also to have new meanings, new insights. And also, of course, it's a very powerful tool to show to decision makers if it's maybe around funding. So this is much better to understand, especially you reduce the time really to understand complex data types or data problems that you basically have then with one fine scientific visualization. I think the blood pump here says it all. It shows you a little bit then how this basically is accelerated with the velocity and so on. So in this end, um, you would say this is applications. Now we look a little bit into now what is basically the supercomputers um, that we talked about. But here is a, let's say, more practical element that the top 500 lists list is important, um, but today we would also say it's sometimes perhaps more also a political part to be the number one in the world, like Fugaku here, you see in 2021 already and the first, um, but from the practical perspective, it has always several different piece of insights. Firstly, this um, benchmarks that you see here to create this list 
is um, the Linpack benchmark, and it's also um, something which is not directly capturing the essence of all scientific applications. So you would have a benchmark that says this is a very powerful HPC system, and of sure they are, like Summit you see here, for instance, or Kugaku, or even our Juvel supercomputer, which now in the last couple of updates dropped off a little bit of the list, but was once also in the top 10. Um, our modular supercomputer I was alluding to already in the prologue and earlier. So that you there basically have um, several considerations. And one of that is not only the applications vary a lot. So maybe one system is not good for all the different applications. And secondly, you can see the power channel challenge is something which needs to be considered as well. You see here, for instance, kilowatts um, that you burn here for the number one today in the energy crisis, even of the Ukraine war, we have to say that, of course, this is all a very important factor. Now, when you look again on the top 500 um, list, a little bit just showing you that the different vendors in the game, you see Lenovo, HPE, Atos. As I said, this is a 2021 branch. You see NVIDIA is quite a good share here also. And then um, the country system share of these lists, you see also basically Central Europe is quite strong, but then also China, the United States and Japan is quite strong always in the list. As it says, basically Japan, this Fugaku is still on the top of the list uh, here, basically these days, and it's a very powerful system. So needless to say, the Americans have lots of different systems in the list. Um, and of course, um, in, in Europe, we are smaller, so our systems tend to be less, but we can also announce that basically, Yulik, you see here, EU number one will also be the first to deploy an exascale system, a real big HPC system, um, the biggest for Europe, basically in the 2023-2024 timeframe. I will also talk about this more in future lectures. Just for you an overview, that there's not just one vendor that creates a nice HPC system, and then basically that's it. That was in the past, the HPC started this craze sometimes, but these times are over, they're different parts in in all of this. And with this comes a lot of money in the game, and of course then also tenders in order to get this HPC systems. Just to review a little bit the Landpack benchmarks again, as I was saying earlier, um, this needs to be looked basically with a little bit of um, critics these days. Um, to summarize this, what I said before, um, it's not really capturing um, all the applications. They are much more represented in realistic application benchmark suits that you have here. Um, there's HPC Challenge benchmark suit, for example. We have also a Jupe benchmark suit in Jülich which are much more based on real applications, smaller parts of these applications, but still not only, let's say, um, solve a dense system of linear equations, uh, which is basically the idea of the LIMPAC benchmark. Um, also, we have to say that these days, um, the problems of applications span, for instance, very unstructured um, ways, like, for instance, graph problems. So. There, um, we have also another 500 list called the Graph 500, because their different systems need to have different capabilities to be good in this. And uh, needless to say, with the energy crisis, it should be also not forgotten, uh, if you go to the top 500 list, which I would encourage you to do, basically, uh, when you have a little bit of time after this lecture, go to the top 500 list, you see also the green 500 lists now, um, to, uh, of course, outline that systems are more energy efficient than others. So while, of course, other systems might have much better performance, um, that could be that the system is in a green 500 completely differently listed uh, because it's much more energy efficient, which is today, of course, a very important part as well. So talking about the building blocks to have another view now, we talked about the top 500, the supercomputers, now how we build them. Uh, is something which starts with general computer science. You would say uh, multi-core is probably something which everybody of you right now knows and uses with its own laptop, I think. Um, here, the key consideration is that you have different cores and not so many of them. So you see you have Quirt 6 and 18 and uh, I mean lots of these, but they're not thousands or so hundreds. 
So there we have still a high single thread performance of all of these different processors. And what we also often have is this kind of cages, cache, which is basically um, uh, give you a lot of performance um, if you have the data again, again assessed, and which is also important part in this particular architecture. Now, this is, a, of course, general blueprint, right? It can now vary what is the clock frequency for all these single processors that we have here. But the key message to take away is that here you try to have basically the performance up to the limit. Um, unfortunately, we see that, of course, um, because of power limitations and heat errors, which could happen to this chip, you can put them not any more, more dense and more dense. We basically have then to go to something we call many core chips and then have a moderate clock frequency. But I show you this later. So this is still, let's say, the most powerful processors that you think about. And then this is the key heart, so to speak, even of a HPC machine. So we don't do anything else. We also compute like you do in a laptop. But of course, here the idea is then to interconnect many of those in these recs and nodes. And this will basically materialize during the next couple of lectures. Um, this is an important part. Now, when you want to connect them, um, there are, of course, ways how you can create this. Um, there are two dominant architectures of HPC systems where you would say, on the one hand, shared memory computers and then distributed memory computers. Um, what we have, however, in the practice often is that we have this is nodes that are interconnected and so on, um, basically in hierarchical hybrid system, right? So these are all kind of clusters um, put together, these kind of uh, ships, which we have seen, multi-core ships. And nowadays we even see it in a way, if you want more hybrid even, um, that even many core chips are put alongside as accelerators for certain problems. So a very heterogeneous aspect basically um, of a system architecture and um, the the kind of dominant architectures are also basically referred to as programming models because how you access the memory obviously is different as the name suggests and in the future we have even more heterogeneity probably with quantum devices and neuromorphic devices so with shared memory you have kind of the idea that of course every thread when you do basically parallel computing in a very small scale um, directly on the node that you have access to shared memory. This is important. There's a certain standard called OpenMP um, that we will also have a complete lecture on. So it's also not the goal to understand that all at once. But obviously, the important thing to understand is that every parallel thread here um, can basically access the memory. And note also that we talk in this context about threads and not processes anymore. But the important part is that they can read and write to memory, which is, of course, beautiful because it's very fast, high performance. On the other hand, of course, it also is limiting because um, once you leave the node with the interconnect, basically the other threads in the other node cannot access the memory anymore. Hence, we have to use an also distributed memory. There are two ways um, of shared memory systems, the unified memory access and the cache coherent non-uniform memory access, CC NUMA. So this is something which refers to a protocol that ensures that there's no problem basically with the memory access, uh, which is of course obviously to be checked because when you have different threads at the same time accessing the memory, um, there needs to be certain protocols in place and even OpenMP has a certain directive um, to really mark then this critical regions if you, for instance, want to read and write from the same variable. So basically, you have C, C++, and Fortran in the past that actually was using this a lot. When we look at UMA, you see that a little bit here are the processors again. We have these different levels of caches we discussed. And essentially, then all of them have the same access to memory, the unified access, we call that this kind of um, UMA access, if you want. But then if you have the CC NUMA, you see basically here we have an UMA situation on the left and an UMA situation on the right. Everybody can access the memory here. But in a way, we have here a part that we already would call distributed memory, but it's still a shared memory aspect if there's a memory interface here that gives you a cache current link. 
so and memory coherent link. Hence, um, in a sense, it's already a more or less distributed memory system, but we see it as a that they logically memory system because still there are mechanisms in place that you know users that really use it would the memory just would appear as an aggregated memory with one single address space to program and that's important for us um, and something which should be considered which is a difference to the distributed memory that we have really also available and talk about distributed memory um, you see here then the kind of corresponding illustration it would have, of course, a processors, caches, memory, but it has a network interface and suggesting that through this communication network, maybe InfiniBand, a very good in high speed interconnect, every processor here has to basically, in order to get to this memory from another processor, firstly to communicate. Hence, we talk really about full blown processes here when we do distributed memory. And the way it works is so called message passing. You see here this red arrows. This is a little bit different now when you compare it to shared memory. I think you can see that that basically with all the threads easily going just to the variable in the memory and obtaining the results. Here we always have to do messaging when we basically go across a node or basically to this distributed memory part. There's a standard in parallel computing called the message passing interface where we'll talk about also in the next lecture and then also in lecture four again, which is very important in HPC to understand because this enables you really to scale up. Shared memory programming is one thing. It's very high performance because you're very, let's say, leveraging the memory effect, which is a very high speed storage, so to speak. But of course, it's limited in the size of memory. It's limited in the size of processes um, linking to it. So what you would do is basically then combine it essentially with distributed memory programming. A little bit more on MPI because that's important. Also something which we will dive in already in the next lecture after a short, let's say, practical lecture where I show you again scheduling and things which we basically cover and talk in the second part of the lecture today. But MPI will be important. Also your first assignment will be related to it. So if you have some time after the lecture, um, I would also encourage you to look a little bit more on MPI already. Um, the way it works is basically, you see here, you have kind of message passing in terms of um, um, send and receive ideas. So basically point to point communication, as it is called, but also collectives that we will explore, uh, meaning that one processor maybe talks to all other processors in a certain communicator region. That's all not too obvious um, right now. We will talk about this obviously in lecture two more just as a pointer where you can already look a little bit more into depth when you want to prepare for this course. Coming down to the realistic situation, you would say um, today the supercomputers are all more or less this really hierarchical hybrid power computer. And even here you would say attached to the situation that you have in one node where you basically have a shared memory access, which works very nicely. And then if you want to have a distributed memory, um, you would go across a node and use a communication network to have, let's say, more nodes connected. But today you would even attach many cores, um, some GPU entities probably alongside these different nodes. Um, so even today it's getting more and more heterogeneous, also in the light of the fact that we don't have just many cores these days from NVIDIA. Nowadays with AMD and other vendors, they basically catching up with NVIDIA and we have much more many core heterogeneity in the future as well. And the way how you use these many core chips is also different from the MPI. We'll talk about this when we basically talk about deep learning a little bit for what you can use accelerators and so forth. So a bit summarizing in all of that, um, and I think I'm repeating myself a little bit here now as the summary, you would say they have certain patterns um, that you will use. One pattern is, of course, to have this different, um, you know, message exchanges across the different processors. And then this enables you also to go across the nodes and then shared memory within the node. Uh, but you would say usually MPI is still the most dominant while combining it with shared memory offers you incredible better performance here and there. So it gives you fine tuning capabilities 
But on the other end, are also very complex to program. So it's not at all so easy to perform hybrid programming. And there are certain patterns which you use usually with MPI codes, such as stencil methods that we will also basically apply over a domain starting already in the next couple of lectures. So there's a certain way how you program this, um, basically that support the power programming process, especially if you want to scale up to, let's say, thousands and tens of thousands of cores these days. And this is also something what we will explore in the course. Towards the end, basically here, I suggest to look at a video. Um, this is a Juvel supercomputer that is now basically a couple of years old, but it doesn't matter. It shows you nicely the idea of the different, let's say, modules that are alongside it and also the possibilities for the future. If you think about quantum computing, we have already several publications in this and neuromorphic is also not far away. Um, so this video it captures lots of details and is basically your homework a little bit to look at this video and is also not part of the recording as usual. And we stop here and then continue in a couple of minutes with the second part.